<laughs> Fax, you're on. All right, well, I'm going to tell you this. Last time we were, like, so right on target, I know, which is attracting people. Uh, this is a much harder meeting, in my opinion, to um, – to detail out, I uh, so we'll start from there. I see the question: uh, Should we begin there? Because is that from Pax? It's uh, from Robert. No, it's from Robert, which I'd love R to start with it. Yeah, Robert. He he was he found his way to a little uh, motel six on uh, in Kansas. <laughs> what are we? <laughs> he just got. He just came home. <laughs> he just made it back. <laughs> it, he knows I gave him a, a shout out the other day in the blog. I hope. Yes. He uh, does. Good morning, Robert. Guten Tag. <laughs> Where did it go? Where'd Robert's question go? I can't see it. Here, I got it. What could make Paul go panic dovish? Yeah, there it is right there. I just there backed up to it. Yeah, Thanks. I have it. Uh, I, we won't hear what would make him go panic dovish. Uh, again, the dot pots, which will be revealed today. Uh, um, in Yiddish, I would call a plot, which would, which means to vomit, because I find him uh, uh, ridiculous. I've, I've never understood these uh, oh summary economic projections or dot plots. Uh, they've been so bad at forecasting things. I really I, I don't understand why Powell chose to keep it alive, but, but as uh, Jesse would say, keep hope alive. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I'm not really in, in answer to, I, I don't see anything uh, like we saw last year with that uh, pivot come January. I, I, I just don't see it. Um, so, and that's what makes this meeting harder. Uh, not that last December's meeting wasn't, was easy. It wasn't because of course they raised at the last in December, uh, which is, you know, highly unusual. Uh, only the Bundesbank uh, could raise rates in uh, December, um, which is uh, which did take place. I think it must have been under. Um, oh, I was in the nineties. Um, oh, uh, probably ninety-five. They actually raised rates right at the Christmas meeting, so it was probably I forget who was the. Uh, Bundesbank president at the time, but I had called the economist, Chris Wood, who was the editing editor of The Economist, right on the, the next day, and I said, Chris, because we used to talk, uh, he's, he would interview me uh, in a very low profile way, and he, I said, I got, I got the, um, the next cover for uh, The Economist magazine, and he says, what do you got? So I told him, I said, I would have... Uh, a picture of the uh, Bundesbank president putting coal in everybody's stockings, but it was a play <laughs> on words because Helmut Kohl, of course, was the chancellor. <laughs> so he said, his response to me, Chris Wood said, you've been reading The Economist way too long because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, Economist, that's funny. the Economist used to have some great covers. They once had a cover uh, about OPEC, uh, called Humping to Please, in which they had two uh, camels uh, procreating on the cover. It was great. It was, great. It was so phenomenal. Um, in fact, it was, they used to, for Christmas, used to run a, uh, a, a thing, a, a gift uh, to buy old economist covers by themselves and have them framed. They were, some of them were so great. So uh, I just, but this is a difficult meeting because um, I don't think you're going to see much revealed. But that's why the, um, as we talked yesterday and we got to the uh, Pozar, uh, Zoltan Pozar piece, which got <laughs> so much play. I mean, it, it really was uh, put out uh, by CNBC and then uh, uh, Zero Hedge were promoting it uh, quite a bit. And it got a lot of play because Pozar is probably the best quote unquote plumber in the in the business, in fact, I uh, uh, Matt, I sent you a uh, a 50 minute interview that Bloomberg had done uh, about uh, four weeks ago with Pozar on Bloomberg. And if you can, it's really a great piece. It's it, amazing. It, basically, basically everything Pozar says in the piece yesterday was in that interview. Mm -hmm. But Zoltan is, is I, I've followed his work for years because. Uh, uh, 
good friend of mine in London, who is also a good plumber, uh, really introduced me to poser um, James Aiken. I don't know, Judd, if you know Aiken. Uh, it, I, I know he was a good friend of Bernard's. That's how I know Bernard Connolly. So uh, James and I have known each other for a long time. Um, but it was uh, Poser. It was really a good piece. But I thought that Poser put it out there because it's a really incendiary statement about that the Q, that the Fed will be forced into a QE4 before the end of the year. So we're talking two weeks, uh, a little more than two weeks. And I think he did it because he's going to try to prompt, you know, he won't be at the uh, press conference, but some journalists should probably push Powell to the wall. They have to ask this question. Is there, you know, well, Pozar put out this piece and he's, you know, highly respected because of his, his history of, uh, the, especially the Fed, uh, he was, you know, worked at the Fed and had a great reputation. So if he's putting it out there, what do you have to say about that? So we can anticipate that as a question. Powell will not be able to give into it. So he'll say, well, that's one person. I'm, I'm sure this is other discussion. And I'm sure I, I, it's a strong word. Well, that's one person's opinion. We believe we're ahead of it. We've done these term uh, repo operations to make sure everybody's flush with cash. We just don't see it. Okay? So we prepare only because what do we think the market's reaction will be to that, right? Outside of that, outside, outside of understanding what the market's reaction will be, honestly, I don't care. You don't care. You you don't care what the market's reaction will be to. to oh get, no, I care about the market's reaction, but whether or not it takes place, it, it's you know it, it's a uh, it, it's interesting. It's a conjecture on the part of Pozar. It's yeah. an and conjecture. Conjecture. I I use that word because it's an intelligent opinion. Um, so it's just not you know you know everybody has their opinions, but this is an intelligent opinion. And I think it's, you know, you have to pay attention to it. But I think the markets, because now you got a little bit of the built into it, although, although the debt markets have been a little soft, really, uh -huh. for the last, you know, few sessions. So uh, from from that standpoint, no. But uh, if that's the case, I, what would I expect to happen? If Powell says, well, you know, we understand that it, that's a possibility. And if his his comments are a little bit soft in regards to it, not That's pushing it. back against it. Yeah, you'll probably get a rally in the currencies and you'll probably get a rally in the metals. And uh, the curve ought to steepen, and I stress ought. Um, if if he actually gives any credence to it all, so that's kind of answering Robert's question, that would be the only type of dovish, you know, by saying, well, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, I respect Zolta, he may... We'll see, but we, but he will state that we believe we are ahead of this. That we, that the system is flush with funds. It was interesting in that in that interview with Bloomberg that was put out four weeks ago. He he made a point. He made two. Well, he made a million interesting. I mean, it was an incredible. I I, li, I made the mistake of listening to it when I was working out, Ira. That's I mean, okay. I, yeah. You know, I needed to listen to it with a notebook next to me so I can sit there and write, but. One of the two really interesting points that I that that I took away from it was one he made a point to mention that he hadn't spoken to anybody within the uh, either on, that's on the uh, on the uh, on the committee, you know, right. or or within the Fed in in I think he said about six months. And the second the second point that he made, and this is a man who is really he's the foremost uh, architect of the updated repo system, right? Is, isn't mm -hmm. that kind of fair to say? Yeah, yeah, I would say, so. yeah, that's fair to say. All right. So the really important point that I said is, or that, that, that I took out, and I don't know if it actually is important, but this I think will lead to what you were saying, or at least this is how I see it leading to the, to a dovish response was that he thought the fed acted in, in, in September, he thought the fed acted a little bit slow. It was only a day or, you know, a day and a half, you know, the next day that the Fed had in, in, it began to, to add liquidity into the system. But he thought it acted slowly, he, you know, because it was set up. Mm -hmm. There were signs that the, that, that the reserves were getting low and that, that, the, that, that the repo market was, or the repo rate was about to explode. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, because the money wasn't getting to where it was intended to get to. 
I, I mean, I listened to it. I have to tell you, after I sent that to you yesterday, I re listened. It's a 55 minutes, but 50 of it is Pozar, or maybe probably 48 in total. And I had listened to it before, and like you, you know, I was listening. But after you put out that piece yesterday, I listened. It took me an hour and a half to listen through it because I had mm -hmm. to go back. And, and uh, it's an easy thing to do. It's a really good format by Bloomberg, by the way. Um, so, uh, yeah, the money was not getting to where it was intended. And that's what they were having really problems understanding. Mm -hmm. where, where were all these uh, reserves going to? Yeah. yeah. And, and is there an answer to that? Well, you know, what would make, so let's take what he says. So what would make, uh, and this is, and I have some steepeners. I'm using a 2.5 steepener. Now, in his scenario, they'll start buying coupon related. Now, when he says coupon related, as he says, twos, threes, fives, mm -hmm. sevens, T-bills are not coupons. And again, I explain this to people regularly, and I've, we've done a lot in this room. T-bills are not capital assets. T-bills are mirror interest rate instruments. Mm -hmm. There's no capital gain in a, it, that's a and the T-bills only go to a year. There's no capital gain. Nope. They may appreciate uh, if you buy them right and you can sell them, you know, but there's really, it's not, and people who buy them are buying them for the interest rate. So today, or in fact, uh, on Monday, I, I bought uh, T-bills, 180-day uh, T-bills. I, I didn't check. Uh, so let's say the rate was 1.55, 1 1.60. I'm buying them for the, for the yield. I'm not buying them for an appreciation. I'm just not. Now, if I have to go and sell them, Maybe there will be a little bit so minuscule it won't make a it won't make difference anyway. Uh, so you know it's and he says you know that they'll start buying a coupon oriented. Well, if that's the case, if they go beyond, you know, I'm going to get hurt here because it will flatten the curves. Maybe. And now, why do I say maybe? Because if we go back to the original QE. Uh. QE1 and QE2, when the Fed announced them, the curves actually steepened because the market's anticipation was, wow, this is really a lot of money coming to the system. This is going to be inflationary, This is going, or this is going to get the economy really going. So they weren't buying, uh, the investing public wasn't buying the long end. They were afraid of the long end. So the curves did steepen. And by QE3, when they had seen that, well, it wasn't really leading to curve steepeners, uh, the, the action is much more muted. But as I'm prone to say here, because these curves have flattened so dramatically, in fact, inverted, we know at some point, um, everything's a little bit uh, uh, more, um, oh, let's see. Um, yeah, it's you know it's flat, but but it is has some positive yield to it. But it, as I say, and Gunlodge, it's interesting, has been out for the last couple of days making a lot of noise um, about U.S. debt in 2020. Well, that's my you know everybody who's read me and listened to me for the last 18 months. You know, I just don't, especially in the last year, I don't understand why anybody would extend their duration in U.S. interest rates when the deficit continues to grow robustly, even with the United States in the best economic situation of any developed country. Why is the debt growing? And Gunlotch is very concerned about that. So I want to stay short. That's why I want to buy nothing longer than a two-year and see the way this plays out. And I, I can't stress enough, it's not costing me a lot. Because we know the difference between the two and 10 um, uh, is 18 basis points. So for lowering my duration, if I'm a, if I'm a, a pension fund or anything, or I can, I can buy the safety of near-term duration versus tenure where I run much more risk and and weather this out for a mere 20 basis points, and I say mere 20 basis points, but you know what? I know it's a zero interest rate world, so 20 basis point is nothing to sneeze at, but I don't have to take on all that risk of duration. And that's, it's fascinating where people will go to, um, but 
you know what? One man's trash is another man's, you know, uh, treasure. Well, you know, isn't that isn't that the point that we went back to a while ago? Um, I, I think in one of our first conversations, when um, I'll never forget this, and and I wrote it down, and I've written plenty of notes about this. Uh, it, it, the world isn't so can so. Let me back up. In 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 the, in your last statement, is that with your investor hat on or your trader hat on? Both. You know, okay. Because and that's what I figured. Because it's not it's not a it's it's no longer a question of uh, return on our capital or return of our capital. It's return on our capital. So in the world, star for yield. We who wants to buy you know the long end of the curve when you can put it into the stock market. Well, right, right, and, and I can get a higher return, you know, with high quality stocks. Well, I mean, listen, this room we've gone through a litany of them that are, or at least, uh, um, treasury yield equivalent, and I can get upside appreciation. And <clears throat> if inflation starts to rise, stocks may become actually a place where people hide out if the mm -hmm. yields, you know, are high enough. Your, your treasuries are certainly going to get crushed unless there's more intervention from the Fed, but that'll be a disaster. Yeah, and look at all the, look at a lot of these um, healthcare names uh, like AbbVie and everything else that have been such huge, huge movers that with high yields. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of movement there, right? Because yeah. people, People, people are trying to convince themselves, well, the economy is doing well. And that's when you'll see them buying, you know, triple C's. And, well, those are really bad, but, or bad from my perspective, great from other people's perspective. But I think, you know, historically, those yields are awfully low, and they really don't pay me for the risk I'm taking. Yeah, are you wrong? Yes. Robert Seiko, um, that's, um, first of all, thank you for answering my question. I was in a loud environment. I was listening, but I could not, uh, I could not speak. Uh, well, I have a question it, regarding the yield curve. I know you're not an American historian, but it is bloody Kansas, for God's sake. So if it's a little loud, that's okay. It's under a tractor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially when you're on the machinery. <laughs> yes, I, I hope you're not putting gravel in the carburetor. No. <laughs> no, I was on uh, the production floor. But, uh, all right. This, go ahead. Go ahead, Robert. The yields curve. Yield curve's inverted. Is now, Anne Marie on, by the way? Sorry? Is yeah, Anne Marie? She's in. Okay. Because Anne Marie had a long question the other day about the yield curve that we didn't get to. So, okay. Let's, let's go with this. All right. Go ahead, Robert. Okay, so yield curves inverted. Now it is a positive, albeit early positive relationship. Um, do you recall in the previous cycles, is this the typical behavior of the curve? And by all means, I don't think, or I'd like to hear your opinion. Is, is, is it all clear when it inverts to the positive or do you think it just fluctuates and then may deep down even lower? Okay, first of all, let's, an inver is an inversion is a negative, so let's not call it a positive. So when it flips back to a, a steepener, because I like to be consistent in this. So when it flips back to a steepener, is it deemed to be a positive? It's a very good question, because what happened, all right, let's, and we don't have to go far back. We can go back to 06, 07, when the curve actually inverted, which it did, um, and it was a, uh, uh, a, har uh, a harbinger of things to come. But then the curve, as the Fed, you know, uh, started to become a little nervous, you know, at first Bernanke said, you know, it's all contained. But when the Fed, you know, made their first 75 basis point cut, the curve had already started to, uh, to, to reinvert or steepen, which is a positive yield curve. Not by a lot, but it started. And then once the Fed made its initial cut, when they saw that you know, the world wasn't quite uh, as contained as they wanted to believe, then the curve, of course, steepens because all the pressure is on the short end. And up until then, short end, you, you know, short yields were, were, were fine. You, you could get pretty good returns on CDs. And, uh, but the curve then does steepen. How long it stays inverted 
you know, there's different studies, and it all depends whether you use the 210 as your barometer or the three-month 30-year, the three-month 10-year. You know, everybody, when, when yield curves all of a sudden start to get discussed, and um, it's always, I've been miffed by it because, again, you know, I can go back to the blog uh, as we come upon its 10-year anniversary and, and hits that I did with Santelli where basically, you know, CNBC would, couldn't wait to get us off because nobody wanted to talk about curves. And, um, and that was when they were beginning to flatten, too, because uh, Santelli and I did a, a few really important ones where we had bounced off 73 basis points positive. And that was an interesting point to hold. And we went back to 100. And then we started coming back down in the curve. Uh, and this was, you know, not long ago. I'm talk this is in the last uh, three years, I think, four years, because the curve was out to 125, 130 on the 210 I'm talking about. And then once we got through 73, it flattened rather dramatically. But when uh, the curve... Really, just, guys, yeah. I, I've got futures up, and I was looking at, I can't get the, the charts off the CQG, the correct ones that I was talking to. I can't get them off, of, you know, I get them elsewhere, but I can't get them off of there either, because CQG yeah. just doesn't provide it. It's yeah. one of their, it's been a flaw of theirs. I've argued with them for 30 years about this, and they just... They're not, uh, they just well, don't do it. you have to buy the can or feed to do it. Right, right. And it'll get better. Uh, there's there's room there for somebody to get into that market and put it out. Uh, Bloomberg's is stale when you get it, but it's real when you pay for the, uh, whatever, the 2500 a month, you can get it uh, in real time, and they're great. Um, so, okay. so you're looking at these curves, Robert. So when they start to go back, then you – you see, I'm I'm always of the belief that when yield curves steepen, it's not a negative for equity markets, but not initially. They view it as a positive because it shows that the Fed is providing capital to the market. You know, you know the low rates, uh, short-term rates are low, and they deem it as a positive. Everyone say, oh, you know, the 10 years going up in yield, that's negative. No, it's more important what the short end is doing because that's where the Fed is is making its statement. And if it's letting it steepen, initially, I'll tell you what, it's good for all asset classes, historically. Commodities, equities, it's not good for bonds. Um, but the metals uh, will do well. Right now, all the algos are pegged to the long end, believe it or not. So when the so when the curve is actually steepening and, and long yields are going, that's what the gold's been watching. But it, from my historical analysis, and it goes back a long, long time, uh, steepening curves uh, will generally um, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's usually positive. And then if the Fed says, well, we're behind the curve, then they're going to be forced to raise short-term rates more aggressively, just like they cut them more aggressively. So that's when the activity will pick up across asset classes. But at first, the steepeners, and you can go back and look in 2007, 2008, because once that curve went from inverted to start to steepen, we had highs made in the equity markets, right? 15, 79, 80, I believe, on the S&P prior to the, you know, uh, to the Lehman debacle when the market really starts to, to turn south. But the market had, let me put up the S&Ps. So um, you can run a Judd on a monthly. We can see it in full, in its full glory. Um, that brings us back to, uh, to, to, um, uh, uh, to Poza. In, <laughs> in what regard? Well, when he's talking, when, you know, you know, you're just bringing up, talking about the yield curves while Judd is bringing it up and, or you're bringing yeah. it up and then, and uh, uh, talking about the Lehman event and the high that the S&P made at 1579, you, you know, he, he's making the point that we're looking at a bunch of little Lehman events, a bunch yeah, of long-term, well, right? A, a bunch well, of hedge funds, banks, institutional. Only as banks. he, only as he points out, if it extends itself over a number of days so that there is a sense of real fear in the market. If it's a one-day event, it's like like we had when the, on September 15th when, or 16th when it bumped 10 bases, when we went up to uh, 10% because it was a funding issue, it was a one-day event. 
the repo rates did stay a little elevated, but nothing that said, oh, there's a problem in the system, which means, which means that people are hoarding collateral. Uh -huh. That's what makes it a Lehman event. The problem with Lehman was that a lot of people didn't realize that they had, they had become a creditor to Lehman because Lehman had borrowed all the, you know, through the repo market, had attained all these, you know, assets. And now all of a sudden, you're trying to get them back and you can't get them back because there's a bankruptcy. Yeah. Okay. So you have to be careful with where that goes. But okay, so we know that the curve inverts in 06, 07 early, okay? But after the, you know, the Fed and the curve really starts to steepen, I don't have a long uh, 210 up in front of me. If I wish I did, I, I had sent that a while ago. Maybe I do, hold on. I can get better. Uh, I can do this better. Um, hold on. I'm trying to work through this now. I'm sorry. I mean, that's all right. Ira. I mean, I, I have a trouble looking at the, uh, the, um, the Bloomberg yield curve charts cause they, yeah, not, right. I know they're not granular enough. So they're they're not for a technician. They're just for yeah, they're for guys like me, who are who are looking. <laughs> well, thank you for that explanation, Ira. Oh wait, wait, I'm not done because we can go. He's just pulling them up. Uh, hold on one second. Um, okay, so but we do know that. The curve inverted late 06, 07. But look at, if you look at a monthly S&P chart, you see that the high was made October of um, 07 at 15.86. Uh, I'm looking at a monthly. So I may be off a little bit, which really, uh, it, interestingly, was a double top uh, mm -hmm. for the most part of March 2000. You can see it pretty good. And then... Even though the curve had started to seep and the, the fears that overtook the market and the Fed was busy cutting rates, you know, we, we break for the next um, 18 months. But the high was made then because the Fed had been, you know, trying to head off, um, so, you know, the concerns uh, in the marketplace. And they were, you know, beginning to sense that there was something bigger wrong there. So the curve was steepening and and yet the, it had made its highs and then and then failed, even as the Fed was busy, uh, went on a cutting course. And of course, we got the Lehman bankruptcy in uh, October of 08. But I'll tell you what, October of 07 was an interesting time because on October 6th, I believe it was, um, bank earnings were coming out for the quarter and Citibank and JP Morgan, JP Morgan uh, came out with earnings and they were pretty good. Citibanks were okay. In fact, Citibank was trading at the equivalent of around five hundred dollars. Because don't forget, they did an inverse one to ten split. Um, so, and on that day, it's it's my wife, who's very financially sophisticated uh, with her MBA and CPA in international tax. She always wanted to get short stock. So on that day, I called her. And I said, okay, you want to you want to finally get on the short side of a stock, do a paired trade, buy J.P. Morgan and sell Citibank because I had seen the earnings uh -huh. at Citibank were terrible. It were, and uh, even though the market, so I can only if you were to put that stock up from that day because it was an earnings day, I'll never forget it. And she took about ten, twelve dollars out of the paired trade. <laughs> It was a, it was a major home run. She still, that was one of those. She lets me know, why did you tell me to get out of it? I said, well, how much did you think you were going to get out of it? You know, so we, we still have with execution a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And there it is at five fifty seven down to uh, 10. Yep. Uh, it's funny. It's, it's funny. <clears throat> Here, one, one other thing I wanted to point out to everybody is that I, I put up the S&P charts, okay, guys? And this is what I'm always getting back to with charts. You always want to see life of contracts. So if you put up the minis, you're only going back to 97 or 98. It's a much better look if you go back to a pit 
a pit chart and you look at a daily continuation or an active, and then you get life of S and P's. And it's a much better look. Okay, I'm, I am looking, Robert, listen to me on this. I am looking at a 2000, a chart, a 210 uh, yield going back 15 years. And in early 07, the curve is inverted. In late, in late 06, it inverts, it stays inverted. The Fed is way too tight relative to, credit, to the underlying credit conditions. Um, and then it starts to, to go positive or steeper. And so by October, when the S&Ps make its high, the curve is already out to about 100, uh, not quite 100, probably about 75 to 80 positive, okay? Mm. And it goes, we, we go by 2009 all the way up to 250 positive. When was that? Uh, would that would that have been around March? Would that have been around the, the lows of the, the equities? Yeah, right, right, because they were so aggressive in cutting. And you know what? And investors were nervous. Well, what if they get this right and they create a lot of inflation? So they were they were running, you know, and even and they hadn't started the QE. Well, they started the QE program late in 08. And the first thing was, of course, that it steepened. If you want, I'll send you this chart. Oh, please. Okay, I'm going to send it to you right now. It's an interesting chart. And you can do with it as you want, but you'll see how beautiful the picture is. I mean, if you find a way to post it. Well, I can post uh, it to me too. I'll put it yeah. up right here right now on a page. Okay, you guys can see it in real time, what this looks like. So this is not hypothetical. This is this is real what I'm telling you. So, and yet, you know, after the, and, and the, the initial reaction on the aggressive move is that the equities go and make highs. You know, basically, you know, uh, it's all clear and everybody's, you know, pretty comfortable. The Fed is getting aggressive. They're they're taking the bull by the horns, so to speak, and getting out in front of it. Hmm. I just sent it to you so you can see how well it sets up. So, Robert, that I, I hope gives, you know, and how it plays out, I, I can't tell you. But it'll also be important to watch. Uh, as we, you know, as we've discussed European, because uh, we'll watch to see what these curves do over there. The German curve is now 32 positive. France is 61. I'm talking about steepener. So we're Finland, you know, I'm giving you the two tens, but these will be very interesting. And Japan, where the JGBs have actually gone, pro gone positive. Um, so that curve, is, the Japanese curve is starting now to steepen a touch too. Will these lead to a global-based uh, equity rally? But again, we speak of these in relative terms. I, I can't stress that enough. You know, we're, it's all relative. You know, so when I looked at, and look at, you know what? For a day and a half now, the DAX has retra as everybody's tried to sell it. Uh, it just keeps bouncing back. Did you get it, Judd? Yeah, I got to send it to myself on the other computer. All right. Ira, right, when, when with, with the ECB tomorrow, uh, yeah. I know Lagarde's got to be really, really, and uh, I, I don't want to switch, and I don't mean to switch. I want to. No, get no, no. We, this is important because this, is. this is all part of the Fed, too, by the way. Okay. So, yeah, exactly. So, um, the, the the she's she uh, i know that yesterday we talked about how she's going to try it's her first press conference she's not going to rock the boat she's going to say things right you know correctly so that the algos don't deconstruct every word you know and yeah. and just go crazy and baragas and make all kinds of volatility so she's going to be safe and and but you know there was something that you that we talked about a little bit yesterday i want to get back to and you mentioned it also in your last blog post is uh you know the 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 need for this big infrastructure spending okay the the green infrastructure mm -hmm. spending right. is that when you're talking about two plus two is five in the blog yesterday last night yep. is this is this what leads into the big infrastructure spending is that what leads into 
into the, the into the euro bond? Yes, because initially, first of all, you don't want to buy bonds at fifty negative fifty basis points anyway, right? Anybody, no. anybody raising their hands there? I can't no. see. So, <laughs> no, uh, gracias. Okay, all right. So, so any reason that some investors can find to dump, and this was my argument. You know, this is why I push back uh, against Mark Faber when I did that podcast with him. Which, mm -hmm. believe me. Uh, that's what makes these. It makes today's conversation so so wonderful because we can push back at each other, and he wasn't insulted. We had a great conversation. I just disagreed with him about taking on duration, and this is where, unless the world goes into a absolutely deflationary depression cycle, you have no chance of coming out. So I can get more yield and stay short term and have more flexibility than I can if I take on more duration. Because uh, I'm mean, tell you what, if inflation pops, uh, Rich Dennis's slower fool theory is gonna be in full in full view for everybody. Hmm. Because who, who do you think you're getting out to? You're gonna absorb. As these are capital gains, there's also capital losses to be found. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, th these are very, very good questions. And, and Powell, uh, we actually got a jump today in RSX as I'm looking. Um, so it, it, Powell is aware that it's Lagarde. Powell is aware about Brexit uh, or the British vote. Powell is aware of, of many things. So he's going to be careful here too. And he'd, unlike how Draghi screwed him, if we remember that when Draghi yeah. in back in June when when Draghi was speaking at um, Sintra in Portugal. He right before he buried Powell because he went so dovish that he absolutely trapped Powell at the June meeting, and it was right before the June uh, FOMC meeting. It was a terrible, terrible thing. I, I have no love for. Uh, I uh, I have I have no love for Mario Draghi. I, you know what? I understand what he did, you know, and I've been consistent from the day he started down this path, but. He had nothing else, and I think he loved being in the uh, the seat of ultimate power, without any re uh, any um, uh, responsibility to anybody. You know, Merkel scared him because the Germans would have really blocked from the German government. Forget the Bundesbank; they could isolate them. But he had to he had to play to Merkel, which he did, and Merkel gave him the cover. But I, I think, you know, Lagarde is just like uh, Powell did not inherit an enviable position. Lagarde's is worse. And she knows it. She's uh -huh. she's she's very bright and politically, politically very astute uh, to understand what she was left here. And she's really trying to race out in front of it, which I thought would happen because she knows this is a this is a disaster. Uh, now it's not an irre irrevocable disaster. She's just trying to figure out the best options uh, to get the most uh, structural change without the most without causing the most disruption. And that's a that's a that's a tough political act. But that's what separates really good leaders from. Um, leaders that will question uh, for a long, long time. So uh, she, she, may, she may get a Nobel Prize for this <laughs> if she can, but <laughs> she's been left a terrible. Everybody at, the, everybody at the table has a full house and she's trying to draw to an inside straight flush. <laughs> oh, that's a great analogy. But she's got the political chops to be able to, to she, navigate she around does. that. She does. It's not to be minimized. She's she's good. There's so many, so many interesting things converging right now that that it's mind boggling. You know, it's mind boggling and it's it's fascinating. Fascinating. Oh, it it is, and the market really is not set up for it because again, it suffers the complacency of all the money you want. Um, uh -huh. 
uh, has really made everybody lazy. And well, I, better not lazy, but complacent. Because, hey, it, everything comes back. You know, as that when they used to, somebody used to put out those economic cartoons with the funny voices. Uh, you know, and he had the one uh, buy the fucking dip. You know, <laughs> they oh it, the guy was great. He he had a thing on. Um, Keynes versus uh, Hayek, they were they were great, but that's where it started. With the, it was a it was a um, cartoonish. So, uh, um, that's uh, that's uh, that's all, and uh, and it, and it's but it but it is out there, and and she's got Yeoman's work. So, Powell is really uh, a far better central banker than Draghi was, even with his dancing around. But he understands, and especially with Richard Clare, the, the vice chairman, who, if people bother to read what he's written for the last six months, it's all about the, the role that the Fed has to take on in the international environment, which let's come back to Pozar, because Pozar says, says the same thing with the FX swaps. That's what he said. And he's talking, you know, so it'll be an interesting question. So oh, I'm glad we got there. It's an interesting question to see if Powell discusses the potential. Well, the swap lines already exist. They've been put in. Bernanke left them. He never pulled them down. Some people in Congress were not happy about it. But the role of the United States with its reserve, its reserve currency in a, in a fiat currency world because don't forget, it's a different role than what Britain played when Britain ruled the, uh, ruled the seas and the British Empire was um, at its height because then it wasn't, Britain was the reserve currency or the, the currency of the global realm, but it was a, um, a gold uh, standard and a silver standard, which, of course, the Chinese will never forget what the Brits did to them by de depreciating silver because China was on a silver-backed uh, uh, standard. You know, the whole, if you read about the Opium Wars and the Boxer Rebellion mm -hmm. and what Britain did to break the Bank of China, it was to break the value of, of silver. Um, so all these things, uh, and it makes the world a different place. And the, so the U.S. will let's, we'll listen closely about swap lines. If there's swap lines... That would be a somewhat, let's go back to Robert, that would be a somewhat dovish because that would show that the, the, rather than just having a line or two in the FOMC statement, the Fed has even greater concerns about it. Because when, if, he, if he gets a question and he answers it in depth, listen to what he says about swap lines because that's where Pozar goes to because Pozar talks about the pricing in the uh, FX swap market. So uh, I'm glad we got there. Uh, but I'm not looking for anything like we saw, you know, at, at the October 31st meeting. Nothing whatsoever. Um, uh, it's not going to, you know, that one I thought we were able to diagnose from beginning to end. And uh, th the way that was handled, uh, you know, as we talked in this room, this room did very well because they got it. They got it. We were prepped. And if you were patient, Things and uh, things on you know, and you waited for for your moments rather than chasing. It was it was really a good day for trading. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. And today and and today, and today is too. Today is setting. Today has so many different. Today has so many different possibilities to set up in the, in a similar way. If, if we're, with everything that we're talking about, you know, the the breath I think is would lean at least, and maybe I'm clouded because of the, the 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 discussion on yield curves, and also clouded by by Posar by Posar's assertion that we're going to see the beginning of QE4 within the next couple of weeks. Um, that would that would have to start today and tomorrow going into the you know we've obviously. already seen the metals trying to pick up with the yeah. with the long end of the curve and whether that's real or not you'll find well, out this afternoon well, we here, are going to find out and, and also the russell is leading the way down yeah. the, you know just relatively speaking in the last half an hour 
the Russell, the Russell came right back through that, that 1629 area, which has been a real solid, solid target for us and mm. in our room. And yeah. that dragged the, the, the other indices down with it. Yeah, it's, you know, so it is set. But again, we have all these things. So I, I, you know, I'm just telling everybody, as we always do on these days like this, because the algorithms are key worded. You must That's, not forget that. If there's one that. thing that Josh Brown uh, speaks well to is his understanding of how these algos work. And he, too, is cognizant of it, you know, about getting pushed out by them because they react to a keyword. And that's, and when you watch Powell, you know, it, it's really one of, it's one of the things that irritates me in today's world, as everybody knows, is that the media still gets access. Um, they're quarantined, but they do get access to write their reports, like from all the Fed speakers. Uh, they still get, you know, unemployment data, they're, they get it. 30 minutes early so they can do the write-up when it comes out, what they have to write up ready. So, but the things are key worded and I can't, and that's what the algorithms are pegged to. That's to me a, a bad, it's a glitch in the, in the system. And uh, I speak of that as a, as a uh, trader, like everybody else. Well, where am I going to, uh, yes, it creates volatility, but the world of volatility has changed so dramatically because it's, and it's, so I try to take advantage of it because, and that's the patience that I continue to counsel. I know we all want to be involved. Listen, I've, I've worked long and hard putting together the scenario that you're hearing from me, what I put out in the blog last night and what I put and went into the discussion we basically had, that's a lot of work. And if you don't think I don't, I want to be, I don't want to be involved. I do, but I have to hold myself back. All right, we have uh, Marlene here from France. So this oh. is a good subject of yours, okay? Here, yep. she writes, in France, we keep having those economists and TV programs to explain the nasty effects of the public debt and show how devastating it was in Greece. They're preparing us. Budget austerity, hmm. question mark. Wow. Hmm. I did not get, get it. Your short equities, long bonds, question mark. Okay, so... Okay. All right. So if you think that debt is bad, so you're not going to buy debt, right? If you accept that, if you, that running all that, and, and I'm not, you know what, we can have a long discussion about that. Most people who know me, I'm, I come from the quote unquote Austrian school. So debt in the longer term, I just started reading Schumpeter too on the airplane coming here. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's yeah, so great. It's so I great, I, I can't tell you. But if you think that debt is bad, okay, equities will be a much better and safer place in, in the initial onslaught against debt than debt itself will be. And especially, who is this, Marlene? Yeah. So if you've loaded up on French oats, okay, at negative 10 or 20 basis points and inflation – or f fear of debt starts to rise, what do you think those things are going to be worth? And I, w I want her to answer me because she has questions. I'm asking a question. What do you think the value of that asset is going to be? Uh, Marlene, you can unmute yourself or you can type, type in your answer. You mean equity? So the, I, I was talking about the bonds. She says, okay, not much. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> it's, and that's what I argued with, with Faber. It's going to fall in value. So, Marlene, my, my discussion then is I'd rather own a hard asset that earns something, meaning earns, earns uh, income, right? I'd rather own uh, EDF. I'd rather own uh, – uh, we can go through different French companies, but at least they have hard assets – if prices are going up because, you know, inflation or whatever, I, I'm better off there than I am owning a silly piece of paper in which I'm worried about the ability of the, um, of the, of the bank to pay. And it's not even like it used to be, you know, when uh, 
the Bank of France was run uh, with President uh, Trichet when when they had people who who had the bank and had the independence to to act. The Bank of France has no independence to no independent to act. They they cannot be separate from the ECB. So whatever the ECB policy dictates, that's what's going to take place. So you tell me where you want to be. Yeah, so to hear what she's saying, true, it's not, it, it's not already the case. You borrow at negative rates and you buy those stocks that deliver 8 to 9%. Yep. Yeah, that's, right. Well, that's, but that's what they talk about what some of these hedge funds are doing. You know, of course. Isn't that the, isn't that the new... Uh, the new version of the in qu air quotes um, carry trade. Well, it, it is. I mean, certainly an oversimplified version of it, but yeah, um, it, it, it is. It's a of course it's a form of carry trade. That's when that's when the BIS said it was hedge funds that drove the repo market. What were they doing? They were raising cash because they were using it to leverage up to go buy other assets. You know, that's why when you buy some of the ETFs that have leverage, you got to pay attention to what you're buying or, or getting short. You know, if it's a three to one, you know, it's like PIMCO used to, PIMCO, you know, they were about 1.6 on some of their funds um, that were a little more aggressive. They were about 1.6 to one, meaning, you know, that they were, they were uh, 160% invested like on buying bonds so they had some leverage but not a lot but they had their numbers down pretty well where they knew where they'd get enough to sustain and make themselves attractive relative to other funds and as, and as bill gross famously said after he left pimco he said he wrote a piece that was it must have been very hard for him but i know the feeling when he said you know i just may have been lucky and being able to ride the greatest 32 year uh, bull run ever and that anybody could have made money. Think about that. Yeah, well, it's the same thing. In 07, 08, all of all uh, uh, RIAs and and private wealth managers blew up their clients for 30, 40, 50 percent because you know they're they're stuck in that one mantra, and you get. You know, once every couple of decades, you get a flush like that, and and it takes them a long time to recover. Well, you know, it, it's the same. Go ahead, ask any real estate developer. Leverage is great as long as the market's going your way. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, it's, true. it's true. So true. Many of them have not gone bust at least once. That are that are worth right. a fortune. Well, I, you know, I've just. I, 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 when I'm down in Arizona, I, I know a lot of guys who are developers and they're, they're older and they're more cautious, but we're talking about how overbuilt Chicago is because what happens is when things are going right, the banks are throwing money at developers. That's what they do. They throw money at them and they, sometimes they give them bonuses for completing a project because the banks need to lend the money. But right now, everybody's getting a little nervous. Uh, it's heavily overbuilt. You're starting to see some things, and they're not sure about how we work will damage the system because, you know, again, they had a lot of leases out there, and again, and these are not cheap leases. They're not leasing in 08, 09 when everybody's, you know, looking for wherever they can find because they've got creditors to pay. And you're trying to raise capital. These are expensive leases, and if this deal collapses further, and you know nothing ever takes place, you're going to have a lot of property on the market. And if you look around, there are a lot of cranes still building. There's, oh yeah, the West Loop. I were some of that property has doubled in the last six years. Doubled. Yeah, South yeah. Loop too. All over. It, it, until until you're you know until you're forced to sell you know. As as Dennis Gartman and and I have a lot of respect for Dennis, as he would always famously say, "Sell when you can, not when you have to." That's actually one of the very first things that Judd taught me when he when when he started teaching me how to trade in the Nasdaq in 1998. When you need to get out, price is irrelevant. Remember how the Nasdaq moved in those days, you know, ninety nine thousand. Yeah. When you need to get out, 
Price is irrelevant. Get out when, and I've been telling this to, you know, I told my sister-in-law last year, you know, put your, put as much of your money in, into cash as you can. Get out when you can, not when you have to. And pretty soon, everybody's going to have to. Right. Because, and the, and the worst thing in the world is watching a market and go look at the chart we looked at, 07, okay? I was liquidating everything. Because when that curve inverted and I was working in New York, I had gone almost totally to cash. Because don't forget, you were able to get 5%, 4.5%, 4.75. So I was getting uh, a couple of deals, a, a couple of stocks that I loved had gotten bought out. ABN Amro, thank God, thank God that the idiots bought, you know what? Because I tendered every piece I could. I think I had three shares of RBS left in, uh, but I, everything was gone. So I was running to cash because I said something is, you know, actually if in 2005 in the book Inside the House of Money, when I do the interview with Drobny, I had warned what was coming. I didn't see it in its entirety, but I knew that there were problems with the way that they were doing these subprime uh, mortgages. I could understand it well enough. And I said, hey, you know, and I and actually when I worked with Owen at Solaris Hedge Fund, we tried to synthetic. We had to synthetically create short positions because our um, prime broker wouldn't let us into certain assets because our um, uh, covenants wouldn't allow it. So they said, no, you can't. You told your clients. So we were looking to make plays based and it was it was difficult. Because if your covenants prevented you, you could not play in that arena. We couldn't even do European bonds, by the way. So we were not happy about that. But so so be it. So we missed out on, on some things. But we were able to synthetically create some of it. But you, I, you, you, you can see things. And, but the worst part is watching everybody else get rich while you, you know, to ask Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Grantham. You know, it was almost an existential decision for him to go to cash in 98 and 99. Cause he saw what was coming. So, but, and when it came, he was, you know, then he was, everybody loved him. And it was the same in 08 when the stock market wound up down 45%, 40%. And people were, they were rare. They were going, Oh, I, my broker's great. He only, you know, he, he managed my money. I only lost 38%. <laughs> I go, and my kids who had been yelling at me for underinvesting in their uh, in their accounts, when they saw what 08 brought them, they said, Dad, how'd you do so great? I said, because you're in cash. So for all the years you were, for the two years you were yelling at me, you weren't partaking it. But it's tough sitting on the sideline because we look at our neighbors. I learned that when I had my uh, couple of hedge funds. People, they can't take it. They're gnawing, and that's the same with being patient in the market. You start gnawing on your knuckles, and you go, "Oh man, oh man, Matt's he he's fully invested." You know, he's. Uh, I begged my brothers, especially my one brother, in 2000, in in no, I can tell you exactly, December of '99, take 50 percent off the table. You have been enriched with your, and you know, he said, no, my, you know, my analyst, I said, your analyst, I don't go to other doctors and ask you for, for them for advice. I come to you. <laughs> that's beautiful. I, that's what I said to him. My brothers are, I have two brothers who are doctors and they're, and they're great. And I, I get great, brothers. but I, I remind him, I said, you know, this is what I do for a living. <laughs> I said, trust me, you know, and he didn't. He, we were standing around uh, uh, in my kitchen, and I and my nephew, he reminds his dad. He says, "Dad, you didn't listen to a word he said." I said, "He said I know." He says, "Well, I paid the guy for advice." I said, "Yeah, it's a problem with free advice, so uh, it's always questionable." Yeah, I mean, during during that whole time, we'd be at lunch, and I'd get telephone calls. You know, I'm blowing up. I'm blowing up. Yeah. You know, I oh, can't. Yeah. I, there's, you know, some guy tell me, you know, some guy was worth ten, twelve million dollars. He said, you know, I'm down on my last two. Okay, yeah. what do you want me to do about it? You didn't listen. Yeah, and, don't don't listen. Yeah, didn't didn't listen. You know what? And uh, and that's the hardest part. So, Marlene, I'm answering your, you know, but you have to step back and take a look and go, where is my, where am I better off being? Where am I better off being now? 
when bond values go up, yeah, if you're a, and and this is how I look at it. I look at companies now, the stocks that I, that I hold on to and buy, they're the ones who've been paying down debt. You know, one of my favorites is Glencore, and Glencore is struggling because it's always in uh, dark areas, and that's and right now they're under uh, under uh, investigation in the U.S. and in uh, in Britain by the um, uh, um, CFSA. Yeah, by but, but that's the high. That's the ser oh serious financial uh, uh, serious fraud. Uh, Office. Oh yeah. <laughs> SFO. So, you know, the, these these are areas, but but Glencore fits my analysis because they've been paying a lot down a lot of debt. They had taken on way too debt to do these uh, acquisitions, and that's when firms usually get in trouble. You know, it's my problem with, you know, all this negative talk about private equity. I happen to agree with uh, in many ways, not total, but private equity destroys a lot of firms because they take on too much debt to do the deals. And my problem with private equity now, and Matt, take out your pen. Just because there's more money chasing deals doesn't mean that there's better ideas. It just means that there's only so many good deals to do. There's just more money chasing them. So that means people are paying too much. Great example. What we're just uh, anecdotally is what we all see in Chicago are the cranes in the South Loop, West Loop, North Loop, East Loop. Well, East Loop is the lake. But yes, yeah, I see what you mean. Yes, that's beautiful. I, you know, one of my favorite people in the world to watch is Sam Zell. And you know what makes Sam Zell so great? He knows when to sell. And if you listen to him, he's, he's feeding the ducks that are quacking. Because he, he looks at these deals and goes, they're pay, paying preposterous amounts. But don't forget a lot of these private equity guys and, and developers, they get paid. So if you're not doing anything, people go, what am I paying you a fee for? You're not managing my money. You know, it's like that was, you know, Jeremy Grantham's point that if I go to cash because I see what I don't like, then people are, are upset, especially when their neighbors are fully invested in making money. It, people cannot stand it. It's, you know, let's go back to the Ten Commandments, you know, the commandment of thou shall not covet. But we all covet. Yeah, and Zell's in all, all this, uh, you know, all, all these Permian plays now. He's bottom feeding in there. Yeah, yeah. He, like all these guys are in Pioneer and, and uh, EOG, and they're all and they're and, and they all have the same pattern. And all the institutions are all coming into these names. Yeah, no, Judd, that's that's where they're at, and that's where the you know again. And these guys are having trouble borrowing money. There was, in fact, somebody uh, sent me an article this morning to read that a lot of the financing in the Permian is starting to dry up because they can't get funding. Because they got, it's just there's just not enough there anymore for these people. But the guys who have cash go, hmm, how bad do you need this? You know, it's like Buffett lending money to Goldman, right? Should we redo that? Oh, <laughs> while he's having while he's having uh, 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 an ice cream cone with his granddaughters. Yeah, and a cherry coke. Yeah, a cherry coke. That's it. Yeah. And we're and wearing uh, what you call it. Uh, Saucony shoe. What are they? Oh no, Brooks. They own Brooks. I I actually wear Brooks running shoes, and I run a lot. So, yeah, they were. So yeah, he, Buffett is the classic example. That's how he gets rich because he buys. When you know, as he says, when when the when the tide goes out, you find out who's swimming naked. Marlene, it's a French beach. We'll find out who's swimming naked. Oh, everybody. But that's besides the point. Um, uh, it's, it, but we, that's why we look at this and, and we'll, we will love you. The companies that will get rewarded if everything Marlene asks about, of course, will be the company who are most, who have the most sustainable debt and of course, the lowest debt. Cause that, that just is a disaster. You know, of course, as J, as J, Jerome Powell says, well, they have a printing press. Uh, so, we don't have to worry about it. Well, France no longer has a printing press because they they surrendered that part of their sovereignty 
when they joined the ECB. It's the ECB, as Jerome Powell reminds us, has a printing press, but it's not within the sovereign. That's what makes the European Union so difficult, is because they surrendered the sovereignty of control over their money, but not over their taxation. See, see the combination there? And this is what Bernard warned about. That's, you know, where Hamilton, uh, Alexander Hamilton could, after the Revolutionary War, consolidate the debt by, by first of all, haircutting a lot of it. And so the states didn't have to pay as much. So he got that done. That's what needs, that's Christine Lagarde's, she's got, as I tell you, two, two mandates to get the fiscal in order to, to get a fiscal stimulus to take the pressure off the banking and with it, a creation of a euro bond. And you know what? She's trying to do them in a synthetic way. She's going to put on her Marxist hat and, and start uh, doing synthesis because as any uh, student of uh, Marx knows, you know, uh, feudalism, capitalism, communism, thesis, antithesis, th synthesis. She, she's going to find a way to synthesize all that debt into a European bond. And actually, it's one of the good things Draghi did, and he did it intentionally. I'm waiting for his book, uh, because by building up that ECB balance sheet, the only exit out of that whole thing is not a quantitative tightening, is the creation of a European bond. I hope uh, that, that helps uh, Marlene. Let me know. She said, yep, uh, I'm glad you talked about this as everyone is smashing the capitalist system. But capitalism was never about debt at first. It's a system that encourages taking debt on. Right. That's right. And, and really, you should really watch the French uh, energy utilities, you know, because the France, France has a big role. They are uh, the pr pr I would say the premier player. The Russians would probably disagree with me in the uh, global nuclear energy sector. They build a lot of reactors, and they're pre and they're good at it. Listen, that's why that whole issue with Hinkley Point, and you can go back to my blog. I've co I really covered that. I thought exceptionally well in understanding it. What I didn't understand is why the Brits and the French didn't push to float 20 billion, 25 billion euros of bonds that the ECB would have bought to finance the deal. I, I don't understand what they're thinking about because it was a layup because there was a lack of, of bonds to buy. And certainly the French could have muscled, uh, well, of course that was under Hollande who's a, an idiot of major proportions and it has nothing to do with his politics. He just was not, you know, I used to love it when uh, they when under Sarkozy that uh, France and Germany were so close. Merkel and Sarkozy they called it Merkozy, and I said, well, uh, now that uh, Sarkozy's gone and Hollande is in, do they call it Merde? Because the end of uh, Hollande is D E, and so it, which means shit. So I always thought instead of Merkozy we had Merde, but. Uh, Marlene could laugh at that, but it, it, that was terrible. Terrible. Yeah, well, here, it's because the Brits cannot stand the French, we have an in, inept po political. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I, it's not pleasant what's waiting in the wings, so you have to root for Macron as much as, much as he thinks he's the uh, reincarnation of uh, de Gaulle. Uh, you, you're forced to root for him. So, uh, and and Lagarde, she's good. She's stronger than he is. So it'll be interesting to see the way this plays out because it's really Lagarde now who's trying to make nice with the Germans because Macron is on the wrong side of uh, several of them because he's they think he's punching so far above his wa his weight. So, but we'll see. That that one will that'll take a while to play out. We got anything? I think does that prep everybody pretty good for what we're going to see today? And tomorrow is going to be more important. So, yeah, I was I was going to ask you that. Which one you thought was going to be more important? I I think tomorrow because we're going to ha finally get to see Lagarde, and to see the way she operates and to what she brings 
and presents. Now, she's going to be careful, too, because, again, the Posar piece, being how widely read he is and accepted, it makes them all nervous, as I put in the blog. You know, they're all nervous right now. Nobody's going to move too quick here because if Posar's right, you, you don't want to walk into that year-end debacle. So why do anything now? But, Sarko, but uh, I'm sorry, uh, Christine Lagarde has to speak to uh, certain issues. She's not going to be let off the hook. So be interesting to watch. And it's, I, I, with, with Lagarde, you're going to hear a lot, of course, about the uh, uh, green stimulus, the green uh, infrastructure, the need for it. She'll probably have a litany of things that need to be done. And as long as rates and... And you know, again, if I was a, if I was at that press conference and I was a journalist, I would be asking, well, are we better off returning t- to zero? Because negative is, it, as much as these certain economists argue, it, it's not, it's not a, there's been nothing healthy about it, and it's been a, di- a major distraction for the um, for the European uh, banks. And they're actually pushing back now, so she's kind of in a situation where she has to uh, she has yeah. to be very careful here. And again, it becomes a bargaining chip. She can actually bargain that away if she can get something significant for it. And you have huge rollover gaps in the European debt, and they're just buying it, everything up into the CCB meeting like they're, <clears throat> they're looking for another bond buy. Yeah, that's not it's really not happening. And, and you know what? And look at the, it, it's actually going together with the DAX. So yes, there's probably some shorts out there who are nervous. There, I, I look for her to go the other way. Believe me, if she could get rid of that twenty that twenty billion QE by uh, Draghi at his last, you know, that was worthless. I said it in real time. I say it now, worthless. The ten basis point cut, worthless. Although it does give her some negotiating room, so uh, you know we can spin anything, create whatever narrative you want. Uh, totally not necessary. Uh, it's all there. Now it's just a matter of what you're going to do with it. And again, if you get a fiscal stimulus across all of Europe, there's just no need for it. Eric, do we have time to get into um, uh, Anne-Marie's question about the yep. yield curves? Yes. Re- reiterate it to me. Yes. And that'll be the last thing, I promise, because I got stuff to do. Joe, do you have that in front of you? Uh, I have to go look. Anne Marie, are you still in the room? Let's see. Yeah, she's, yeah, she's showing to be. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, hold okay. on. Let me, let me go look. Uh, I know you prepared something on it. Yeah, hold on. I got to. Here. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> there's much I do know about the there's much that I do not know about the relationships in the market. I do have a question about the yield curve steepening when Ira began to speak about it as we were all together with Anthony. Uh, in trying to understand the space, I need to see the threads connecting what uh, happening with the yield steepening after the sev- uh, after the news several days ago. And when did she send that out? December 4th. She, so she, what she's trying to do is find out what the basic levers are and what should happen in, 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 uh, when the curves either steepen or flatten. Well, I think we got some of that done today. You know, again, I stress this to people because everybody wants to pin you down on this. And I have a study from 2003 from uh, Aaron Perzoff, who was an intern for me, that that we did. So one day I'll make it available because I do, it's down in Arizona. So I actually brought it down this year because I need to reread it. But we, we looked at the yield curves and she was, uh, she was great. She was, I had some, I had great interns. It was uh, because I could pick and choose, but she was uh, Joel's daughter, just phenomenal. She's got a big job now, Morgan Stanley, which I never doubted. Uh, But she, we did, I had her do a summer of research on it. So it's it's impossible to time, okay? And that's the that's as a trader, that's one of the bad things. That's why I get out ahead of myself, as I always warn, 
because on the yield curves, you can't time because historically it could be a six month, 14 months. Uh, until you see the effects of it. You know, that's why economists, when, you know, from Bernanke and Yellen, they always talk about, you know, time lags. I can't time it for you. But all, it's like in 2006, 2007, when the curve inverted. Had you, had you sold and say, well, the world isn't, you know, we're going to, and had you sold everything, you would have gotten beat up because we know that the uh, S&Ps went and made the high in October of 07, right? We just went through that. So it's very difficult to time when you're going to see the effects. Now, so what's it worth? Well, it was a pretty good signal that things were not good, just like this last one. Now, yes, uh, you know, I never believe that things repeat themselves exactly, which is why it's difficult to time. This yield curve inversion that took place is far more difficult because you have so much central bank involvement around the globe. And I can't tell you from any of my historical analysis what the, what the impact and, and time lapse of all this is. And is this a false signal? Because of, especially, you know, uh, when um, Powell pivoted, first they were raising rates. And, you know, more importantly than, uh, than Pozar, it was last year in uh, in uh, in December when uh, Stanley Druckenmiller warned about, and believe me, he wasn't the only one because you can go back and watch Santelli and I. We had discussed it that you either that it was a bad idea to quantitative tighten while you were raising rates, do one or the other, and that's what Druckenmiller warned against the double shotgun approach, that it was going to cause problems, and it did cause problems because. As Pozar talks about, removing reserves from the system. And what's his lag? The lag is now, right? Matt? Yeah. So what took place then, it takes a while to feed through the system. So that's what I'm saying to Anne-Marie. I cannot time it for you. You will see some effects uh, uh, immediately, but we just don't know. And that's when, if you listen to Gunlatch, it should all make you know more sense when he warns about the debt. And that, that, ties, help? that ties it all that ties it all back together i think from from the beginning of our conversation right nicely to the end you know and in, 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 in preparing for today and tomorrow. see if that helps Anne marie see see if that yes she says i understand okay okay because again you know and it's not to dodge it i've struggled with this for 35 years 37 years. And and again, I always like to tell the story, okay? Britain, the UK, and, and I was long gilts, uh, UK gilts, for four straight rate cuts in the late 80s. Four straight rate cuts. I was long gilts and did nothing but lose money because the markets were saying, what are you cutting for? And that's when, quote unquote, the, the vigilante said, you're wrong to cut. And so they would sell the long end, and the and the short end would just rally. The short sterling, as they call it, which is the equivalent of our euro dollars, 90-day money, that that's what was taking place. And I, it was a very valuable lesson to me. Painful. It was, believe me, it cost me a lot more than going to Harvard. <laughs> I didn't know you went to Harvard. I didn't. Thank God. Oh, there you go. I learned well, how to think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You went to Har you went to the Harvard on Wacker. Or no, you went to the Harvard on oh, Riverside and Wacker. Oh oh yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Again, my firm was always praxis. The theory and practice. And what was it right in theory? Not necessarily right in practice. It's a great point. But oh, that's a that's but, a note right there. But when they work out it's very nice when when what you plan out because you see the theoretic and in practice actually works that's when you want to be riding hard because then it's then all the work it's all worthwhile anyway because then you know it's like with the with the whole play in the guilts in the late 80s i learned a lot from it and you know 
I was willing to learn. I go, well, wait a minute. So theoretically, this is just dead wrong. So when I listen, oh, the Fed's going to cut. It's good for long-term debt. Not when you go look at at that curve I sent you, right? Yeah. You get you get the if if that was the case, you should, and you had bought the long end when the when the, the first QE QE one and QE two, you would have lost money, especially relative to the short end. You know, so if you're a curve player, you didn't really do too well. But so be it. So if there's not anything else, we we'll end this one here. Okay, thanks, Ira. Yeah, mm -hmm. awesome. Great. Good luck and be patient. That's all I can tell you. Those are. It, it was a great conversation as always, and and I, you know, I'm. All right. Feel more okay. confident going into today and tomorrow. So thanks again. Okay. All right. Uh, be well, everybody. I'll talk you to you. Too. Thanks. All right.